This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by. I'm Amanda. Um, first of all, thanks, Ryko and Tom, for continuing to make this all happen, and everybody else who is on that long list. And tip to Kurt and James, who kind of got this all together originally. Um, so I was one of the original organizers for WordCamp Boston. I've spoken at this meetup before and the Providence meetup before. Um, and uh, I have spoken at other meetings. No one really cares. So let's get to this. Um, okay, so uh, WordPress being the age that it is, which is to say not terrifically old. It's basically the age of an asshole preteen. Um, we've, we've seen some really great stuff happening with development in terms of the skill, sk the skill sets increasing. So that, you know, a WordPress developer today probably not only has access to more resources than they ever did, but they also um, seem to be gaining a, a real set of knowledge in other skills surrounding just WordPress, whether it's PHP, but marketing and integrations and things like that. Um, so we see all of this great growth in that area. What we don't really see um, as quickly due to the lack of maturity of the community, basically not being very old, is, uh, is, is business skills. I can't think of another way to put that. So <clears throat> uh, actually John, of all people, um, started throwing around this phrase to me, I don't know, about a year ago, where uh, he was very interested in learning, you know, seeing more presentations and hearing more about client empathy. And my first reaction, as with everybody's, was to laugh really hard and be like, that's not a thing. Um, but as the year has progressed, I've sort of noticed it's becoming a thing. And it really kind of set me off on this discovery of, like, what does that really mean? And I have to tell you that after an unnamed number of years since I graduated college and have been doing this almost solely since then, um, it's probably the biggest uh, jump in, in, in client skills that I have acquired. So uh, I set about sort of like putting together kind of like a to-do list of, of my best tips for how to take these, take these ideas into consideration when you're embarking on your client projects. Um, and I gave this talk at a WordCamp Seattle and at a couple of other meetups, and it's been pretty well received. So one of the questions I always have is, like, how many of you are users of WordPress versus um, actually creating sites for clients? How many of you are creating, creating sites for clients? So all of you, except for you. Why are you here? Beer? <laughs> because I heard they don't do the beer anymore, and frankly, I'm disappointed. <laughs> Because you're all really sedate, and I have to tell you, afterwards, okay, ha, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so I think all of this starts with this. If you work with clients, you have at some point called one of your clients an asshole. It's okay, I do it. I did it today, earlier. No, you're like, no, not me. You liar. Um, all right, I'll accept that. Um, so I always start this talk by by giving this, uh, hold on, all right, hold on, can I, boy, you know, clients easy, technology, there we go, technology hard, boop, there we are, all right, so I decided uh, around Christmas time this year that I really wanted to have a ceramic studio, since I've worked in pottery, I've been doing this for a really, really long time, I had the garage, and I've been spending a lot of time on Pinterest, which is the root of all evil in our lives, so I decided I wanted a place like this in my backyard. And so I set about trying to be very methodical about it. Like, I wasn't going to be one of those people you see on the reality shows, you know, where they're like, I have no idea what to do with the cells all. I researched. I figured out what I wanted it to look like. I looked at other ceramic studios and said, what do they have? What tools am I going to need? What problems have they encountered? What's the timeline? What, are, what, what is it going to cost? And I wrote it all down. I thought it really, really through, right? Did all the prep work that you're supposed to do. Problem was, my garage looked like this. So, but I had a whole bunch of friends who were going to help me. So we set about starting to do the job. We started by cleaning it out. And after about two months, everyone was very enthusiastic on day one. And two months later, we realized, like, we weren't getting very far. We had done very little. It sucked. So <clears throat> I had this friend, Lena, and her dad's an architect, retired, and he's got nothing to do. He watches this, whatever. He wanted to come over and see if he could help with that. So 
So I came over and uh, <laughs> he only speaks Russian, so I, don't, I do not. Uh, so for like 45 minutes, they have this very elaborate conversation in Russian where they're both very passionate and they're yelling at each other. And every like five minutes, she would say to me, he said you need a floor. And there's floor. Um, and it would go on and on. And 45 minutes later, she goes, okay, okay. He knows what you need. He's going to draw out what you need. And then he presented me with this. And I was like, oh, that's very clear. Um, and my immediate reaction, and she goes, oh, by the way, he's got nothing to do next month, so he'd be more than happy to come do this. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I don't know if I can do No, no, he wants to do it for free. And I was like, well, aside from being just really weird, um, you know, oh, I really want to think about that because I'm really not sure. So what it made me realize, and like this was kind of like an epiphany for me, was that um, I was intimidated, so I was overwhelmed, and thus I couldn't accept his help. And I thought about how that related to my clients. So there are all these times when I have met with a potential client and they've been talking to me about their business. And I'm like, immediately, it, it's just so clear to me how I can help them. I'm like, given four days and access to your FTP, I'm pretty sure I could make you a lot of money. And yet, they walk away. Um, not all the time, obviously, but some of the time. And I'm like, I don't understand why they walk away. I mean, other than they're an idiot, right? But it occurred to me that it may also be that they're overwhelmed. And that's an important thing to note. So how can we actually change that so that we understand where they're coming from and we make it easier for them to accept our help? Um, I was just like having nothing whatsoever to do with this. I like to show the slide at the end. Because the point is, I think when people are overwhelmed by what you're offering, if they don't feel like they can understand it and accept it and participate in it, if it's not what they originally planned, they will seek other ways to accomplish their original plan, right? So for instance, I walked into the studio knowing I wanted to have, you know, the cement floors, and I thought I was going to put these cathedral ceilings in because I'm a moron and didn't realize how hard that was. And they came in and said, no, of course, that's ridiculous. It's very, very hard. And I was like, no, 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 we'll figure it out. So these are my friends figuring it out. This is exactly two hours before we went to the emergency room. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> It was a thing. So the first thing to recognize is this. Clients are not all idiots because I think we like to think of them as idiots because it makes it easier to, for us to accept why they don't want our help. Um, but this is the thing I want to think about. So in our industry, whenever a client comes to you, they invariably have been burned by somebody else. Like everybody comes to you with a story about how, you know, some other developer screwed them over, right? And you have a very hard time convincing them that you're legit, right? But think about why, because I always say we're an industry of snake oil salespeople. There's, this isn't like contractors where we have, you know, licenses. There's no accrediting body. There's no test that you can pass to prove that you know what you're doing with WordPress. It's just you saying that you know what you're doing and the guy next to you saying the same thing and he's outsourcing it to somebody in it or who knows what he's doing. But, but they don't. And then the second thing is this. So the next reason that we think they're idiots is because they go, oh, I want a website. Is, you know, it's 500, 500, sound good to you? Um, and we go, 500, 5,000. Like, that's a ridiculous, you can't get a website for $5,000. You can't get a website for $10,000. You can't get a website for $15,000. Just pick a number. It doesn't matter because somewhere out there is somebody who charges more money than you for a website. But the point is, since we're so bad about putting our prices online and there's no standard for what those prices are, how would a consumer know what the price it costs is to get a website? Because the real answer is it costs somewhere between, you know, $200,000 and $7.25. And sometimes you outsource a site to India for $20 and you get really lucky. And I'm sure you have all seen a piece of shit $50,000 website. So there's no, there's no law that says if you spend the right amount of money, even if they knew what that was, you're going to get the right product and that you might not get lucky getting less. They're just consumers, right? Um, so, yeah, technology is hard. Uh, is it hard? Oh, there it is. Okay, so think about all of the things that have to happen in a client's company before they can even approach you for an RFP or even to have a discussion about a website, right? Like they have to probably create a budget. They have to go to a bunch of people and get approval. They have to convince people that they need a new website or that they need a website to begin with or they need to add technology to the website. So they've actually done a tremendous amount of work before they ever come to you. 
And they've done the thing that we usually accuse them of not doing, which is research, right? We call them uneducated, but by the time they come to you, they've probably done a fair amount of research. They just haven't come up with an answer that you like. And yet, we have an entire industry dedicated to calling them idiots because we love this stuff, right? Think of all the websites out there calling them, you know, assholes and idiots. So the second tip that I give you is this. Um, I've always said that a happy client relationship is about setting good expectations. But that's not even enough, I've realized. It's really about creating matching expectations. And here's what I mean about that. So <clears throat> if, if a client comes to me and says, I want a green pool, right? A developer is going to approach that differently than a designer is going to approach it, then I'm going to approach it. They have an expectation. But what I hear as a developer is I need to, you know, dig a hole and, and get some concrete, things like that. But to the client, that doesn't really matter. What matters is at the end of the day, they get to swim in a pool, right? So it's about making sure that our expectations match. As you're writing these contracts, you need to be really conscious of what you're writing. We, as, as uh, in the services department, we like to write these contracts that are full of very specific objective things. And that's great. Like, you know, we will create a hole in your yard that is 25 feet by 17 feet by 20 deep, and at the end will appear the hue of, you know, hashtag uh, F24, whatever, you know what I mean. Um, but that may not be the same thing that the client is expecting. And bringing them along the education curve in a non-condescending way is a really important part of that process. So creating good ma matching expectations. Um, the, what, the way that I do this is by creating contracts that not only spell out how we're going to deliver technology, but what the result is going to be. Um, the other part of this about good expectations is understanding that if you overpromise, you are ultimately setting yourself up to be very unhappy, as much as your client is unhappy. So like one of the best questions that you get when you open a contract is how long is it going to take to build a website? You don't know the answer to that because I don't know the answer to that. I also don't know how much it costs to fly between LA and New York because it changes every 45 seconds. The answer is, I know how long it takes for me to build it, but a website is not as simple as me building a website. There's a lot of interaction with your client, and you cannot determine how long it's going to take for them to fulfill their portions. So the contracts that I write tend to be, um, you know, uh, from the time you sign the contract, seven business days later, you'll, de you'll receive the first deliverable. From the time that you approve that deliverable, you will receive the next one seven business days later and so on and so forth. Because what that very clearly illustrates to them is the role that they play in delaying the, or you know, in just the timeline of the project. And then I use a project management tool like Teamwork to show how those delays, I mean, you could use Google Calendar, it doesn't matter, you know, how those delays affect things. As they, you know, every day that they don't approve something, it pushes the other deliverables back and they can see it in real time. <clears throat> so, um, Accept responsibility, what I was just talking about. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, have you seen this, this, this thing? This is actually pretty funny. Developers uh, have all seen this. So, there's this thing about uh, anytime you take over a project from somebody else or, or you start development on a project where uh, clients don't understand how complicated development is. Like, if there's a delay, they don't, they just, they're idiots. They don't understand why something was more complicated than we originally thought it was going to be. Right? Um, so there's this, uh, this story that I think a lot of us have read um, that talks about uh, some guys where they decide that they're going to walk between like LA and San Francisco, right? So they decide that they're going to map it on Google Maps, and Google Maps says it's going to take, you know, 12 days, however long it's going to take, right? And so they tell their friends, we'll be there in 12 days, make dinner. So they set off and they're walking, and on the very first day, they realize that there's some mountains, so they climb up the mountains. But that takes longer than they expected, but who knew there were mountains? And then as they're climbing down, they've got blisters, so they have to take a day or two to like sit there. So they tell it, you know, it's gonna be 14 days instead of 12, but definitely still make dinner. We'll be there by lunchtime. And then, you know, as time goes on and on, it's taking them longer and longer and longer because there weren't all of these things. How could they have predicted that it was gonna be a rainy season and that like a bridge was gonna be washed out? So developers love this story, right? Because it's like, see, no one has any idea what's coming and how can you predict these things? How can we make accurate estimates? But there's a problem with this. And, and it's that when, when clients hire us to do the job, right? Um, it's sort of like, sort of like 
they're hiring an expert. So they're not hiring, come on, they're not hiring this guy to map the trail, right? They're hiring this guy. And if you're hiring this guy, you expect that he knows this is rainy season, you know, bring a bag to pee in so you can drink it later so it doesn't delay you on road, bring an extra pair of shoes, you're gonna wander cut. The point is, they're hiring you because you're an expert. You're supposed to know and be able to predict some of these things that are going to happen. So I understand that setting, that, that creating estimates is an incredibly complicated thing that they've done a million scientific studies that it's incredibly hard to be accurate about. But what I would say is this, we can't use the excuse that clients are idiots and they don't understand how development works. No, they don't. That's why they hire you. You understand how development works. Think about it this way. Every time you've ever hired a contractor for any reason, right? So Comcast says that they are going to come to your house between the hours of 2 and 4 p.m. and you take off work or not because you work at home. But bottom line is you want to watch American Ninja Warrior that night and you expect them to be there between 2 and 4 p.m. And when it becomes 4.02 and they have not yet arrived, raise your hand if you care why they're not there. Nobody cares. They are not there. You are not going to see who wins on American Ninja Warrior. And that's the important part. You went to Comcast because they're the experts. They're supposed to fix it. They haven't fixed it. They're in the problem. Um, so stop assuming. Um, <laughs> So uh, about the time I graduated from college, my mom said, go out, buy a suit, get your hair cut, go on, you know, for your interviews, because it was the 90s, we'll say, and that's what you did. And I remember I booked an appointment at this really fancy place in Boston, here, the winter and sea. And uh, I went in, and uh, I sat down, and she showed me a picture very similar to this one. She was like, this would look great on you. It had been sitting on her mirror, this picture. And I was like, Happen. Like, my hair just isn't ever going to do that. And um, two hours later, I walked out with that haircut. And it lasted for about an hour and a half. And <laughs> then I didn't have, like, another haircut by a professional person for, like, seven years. Because, yeah, you get it, right? Yeah. <laughs> this was never going to do that. Um, so, but here's the problem that I, I realized. We do this in our industry, too, right? So we don't do it with haircuts. Here's what we do it with. We do it with fonts and plugins and themes and colors. Everyone here probably has a font that they've been like dying to deploy on site or a plugin that does something really cool and they're like, oh my God, wait until the next slide. I'm gonna figure out how to work this in. Wait till you see how this does this. But when we do this, we start with assumptions about a job, right? So this is the same thing as a client coming to us and saying, here's my expectation of what's gonna happen with this website and us going, no, 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 no. Here, you know, we need to start fresh with every single client and put these away and make blogs about our cats and dogs for a special day with all of these. Um, okay, so <clears throat> I like to call this the year of the PM, the project manager, which is an essential, pretty much what I do. So if you work by yourself, you are your own PM, but if you have a couple of people or you work at an agency, there are project managers involved. And a project manager's job is to make sure that everybody is not only doing their job, but doing the appropriate job. Here's the example I like to give. So my friend was telling me this story. She's a product, uh, product manager down in San Francisco. She said, well, I told my engineers I need a donut by noon tomorrow. And my engineers came back to me and said, oh my God, we can build you a donut machine. It will make as many donuts as you want and it will be done Thursday by like nine or 10. She said, that is awesome. And if you can build this machine and have it produce one donut by noon tomorrow, go for it. And if not, make me a fucking donut. Because that is how developers think. They're like dogs with a bone, right? They see a problem and they want to solve it, which is great. The problem is that not every problem needs to be solved. And a good project manager is not only going to be able to help you understand which problems need to be solved, to what level, but in what order, right? And understand that you are not working in a vacuum as the developer or the designer or the project manager, that everybody is sort of, it all has to work together in the end. And the project manager does that. So one of the things I found out was very interesting is if you do not trust your project manager to do their job. Sometimes you get lucky and there's a project manager on the other end, the client end, and they're managing everybody on their end and they sort of become the PM for the project. That's a very lucky thing because who loves anything more than working with 23 people from your client company? Like a project manager is a single point of contact. So 
some agencies work differently. They let you know developers talk to clients and designers and everyone gets on the phone. I think that's a really bad idea most of the time. I think it's nice to have what's called a technical PM who is able to converse with the client, understand everything that they need, everything that's going on with the project and disperse that information to everybody in the group so that you can make decisions and then return back to the client. So trust your PM. <clears throat> so uh, <laughs> this is during the project. I was working on this project, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. First school, wasn't even in school, so I don't know, make phone calls. But the uh, point is we were building them a WordPress site for their entire school, right? And we were trying to convince them how important a blog is, and they already had this newsletter that they were writing. We were like, well, this is perfect. You're going to take every article that you put in your newsletter, and you're going to enter it into your site as a, as a blog item, right? They, there you go. Content. Boom. Done. And they said, well, we can't really do that. Because the person who puts it together, she's the art teacher, and she does it in Photoshop. And I was like, well, get it to it before Photoshop. That's the English teacher, and she gets it late. And there were all these problems that they weren't going to let me solve. I mean, I'm an aggressive person, eventually I would have solved it, or I just would have killed everyone in my path. But I realized at some point there wasn't really any point to it because no matter whether I solved the problem or not, they just were never going to do it. So when we talk about sustainability, there is a point at which you have to accept what it is with your clients. When, you know, I can set up exactly how I think, and I'm generally right about this, what, how this actually function, right? But if they're not going to use it, what good is that? So a blog is an amazing example of that, right? Because generally speaking, we would set up a blog for clients, right? And a lot of them are always very enthused the first week and a half. And then once they see the reality of it, it's, you know, it's a completely different animal. And a year later, the blog has two posts. Um, so appreciate client responsiveness. One of the things I think we all agree with is that it's really aggravating when a client wants your site done tomorrow but does not respond to your emails today. Um, I think one of the interesting things is everyone thinks what they're working on is the most important thing, right? But in your life, it's not the most important thing. It's one of the things you do. So we have to understand that our clients have the same thing. They have all the shit going on in their life. You have all the shit going on in yours. And the place where those two things cross over is an incredibly small piece of landscape, right? Um, so I think it's a lot about just understanding that and finding a way to work within that and being patient when things aren't coming back to you in the, in the timeline that you would appreciate. Because if you work the, the contract in the right way, all it's doing is pushing the job back. That's fine. You have other jobs going on at the same time. Instead of being aggressive about the fact that they're not, that they have unrealistic expectations of you, it's better to just maintain a flat line of like, here's the consequence of your actions. And I am ambivalent towards how that works one way or the other. Um, so yeah. Um, deliverables. So again, going back to the thing about, about the pool. So <clears throat> what I often find is at the end of a project, we are ready to turn it over. I'm at the point of turning over a project actually this week. And I have done all the things that development dictated. I've entered all the copy that I was given. Um, we've turned everything on. The theme works. We've bugged it. But the bottom line is, as I go through as project manager, I can still see that some things just don't work. Like a form doesn't send correctly. And it doesn't send because we didn't hook up gravity forms correctly or, or we didn't input an address because they didn't give us an address or whatever. So you could say, well, you didn't give us an address, so we didn't put one in. But the reality is for a client, again, they don't, what they care about is, do I get to watch American Ninja Warrior? That's what I want to know, um, not how it gets there. So as the project manager, you really have to go through and look at it from the perspective of the actual user, not you as the contract deliverer, if that makes sense. Um, uh, so uh, talking about the difference between Doing your job and what the client actually expects. Let's see if this actually works. Sometimes it does. Ooh, work, work, work. No, no work, no work. All right, wait, hold on. Uh. See, he delivered the monitor. <laughs> but it got there. 
Ooh, wait. Ugh. Here we go. I love this one. Nerds love this. Okay. So I want to introduce a concept, and this concept is emotional debt. So do people just nod your head generally if you understand the concept of technical debt? Technical debt, bobblehead? No, okay. So technical debt is this. Technical debt is this side is due tomorrow, and um, we need X function to work. We know the right way to do it, but we're going to do it the bullshit hacky way to get it done, and we understand at a later point we'll have to circle back and do it the right way. But we probably won't ever actually circle back because that is the reality of technical debt. And technical debt just tends to grow like the national debt as opposed to getting solved. Um, so, uh, and you know, there are things like marketing debt and whatever. So I want to introduce the concept of emotional debt. And here's how this works. Um, client work is stressful, right? We're all trying to get out of doing client work and into product work because we think that's so much better and you don't have to deal with clients. That's an unfortunate reality, not true, but whatever. Client work is stressful, right? So every time you have a client who says, I want you to do X, and you say, that's not in my contract, or um, that's not the spirit of the contract, or I don't want to do it, or you're annoying, or any of those things, right? It creates an emotional debt because we're, that's stressful for you, right? That's a lot of stress to carry. When you do things kind of half-assed, I have a belief, I don't know what that is, but it's weird. When you do things half-assed, oh, that's the mic? Oh, I don't even need a mic, okay. Hi, Mike. Hello. I need a hair thing, okay. Um, when you do things half-assed, you know that you are doing them half-assed. And it creates a stress, an internal stress, because you are pretty much betting that some, you're, you're, you're taking a bet whether somebody's going to catch it or not. And you spend that entire time preparing to defend why you half-assed it, right? So I want you to consider this. Wouldn't it just be easier from an emotional debt standpoint, even if it's going slightly out of scope, to just do the thing that makes the client happy or to just do the job the right way the first time? And the answer is, it probably is less stressful for you. It doesn't really matter if the client's getting something they're not supposed to get. At some point, this has to be about you winning too, right? So uh, <laughs> this is the image I always go to. My friend wanted a cake for his birthday. It was really important to him that it be a rainbow unicorn cake. So it was. <laughs> I particularly enjoyed the sushi chef. In the, we brought it into the sushi restaurant where he was having his birthday party. And I particularly loved the sushi chef in back. Uh, that's him. Uh, him too. <laughs> um, it's just easier to do things the right way. Um, so this is the other thing, and maybe not as applicable to, to us, but generally speaking, I give this, this talk to a bunch of very young male developers. Um, they have a very high suicide rate. It's an actual problem. It's an epidemic. But I think also there's something about the nature of the work that we do if you're in development or in this industry where you work from home, where... Um, you are not interacting with people in a very normal manner. And what I mean by that is the majority of your interaction takes place online and it's very hard to hear tone. Um, there is an incredibly high rate of depression in our industry. And it's a thing that I think not a lot of people talk about until you see these like suicides from these young men in, in our industry, which happens actually very frequently, um, unfortunately. So one of the things I like to, to really stress is the idea that this job can't be your entire life because when you make it your entire life, anytime your client says anything about the work that you're doing, you take it far more personally because it really is like all it, it, it's 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 more endemic to who you are. It's it's all that you have. It's it's you know, it's much easier to kind of let these things run off your back when you have other things in your life. So I think it's important to not only talk about your jobs with other people, developers, whether they're in the industry or not, or go see a therapist or, or I don't know, join a support group, whatever that is. But I think it's really important to do that because then when you have a, you have a way to offset some of the stress of this job so you don't take it out on the clients, 
which is a thing that happens all the time. Earlier today, I said I had really to, you know, to one of our project managers, I said, no, I think I've had enough of that client. I think I'm just not going to answer the phone tomorrow. It's to everyone's mutual benefit. Um, but the idea is you have to find other things. It will make it easier for you ultimately. Uh, and I don't know what that is. I took up knitting. Um, okay, so that's my dog Clementine. She's the unfortunate recipient of my knitting. Um, when you are more likely to be happy, um, it's more likely that you're going to be able to stick in this job for the long haul because there's also a fairly decent rate of people who get out of this industry for this reason. Um, so yeah, so get up, move away from the computer. So uh, particularly when you are a freelancer, I think there's this thing where you have clients and they want to be friendly and they say, let's go out and grab a drink and let's be friends on Facebook. And particularly for women who, who do project management or development, I think it's a particularly hard thing. There's a difference between being friendly and being friends. And it's an important distinction. I think it makes it much easier to maintain your professional, your professional line. Here's what was promised in the contract, whatever. If you're friendly, but you are not actually friends. Because there's a distinct difference, right? Um, so what I generally say is, do not friend your clients on Facebook. Maybe after the job is over and you're never, ever, ever going to work for them again. Um, just something to think about. So uh, responding to emails. So everyone here has had a client who sends 33 emails a day, right? Um, and the reason that every time they're like, you never respond to my emails, um, they, start, they start calling your home, they call you, you know, they're, they're trying to find you on Gchat. Um, I think part of the reason, I mean, there are a lot of reasons that happens. I have a client right now who I'm hyper responsive to, but, you know, whatever, still get 100 emails. But I think generally one of the reasons is because I've noticed with developers, they tend to get emails and they don't answer them. What they do instead is they go off and they do the thing that's being requested in the email. Because in their mind, they think, well, that's better. I'll just do what they want. I have nothing to report yet. When I have something to report back, I will then let them know that I've done the job. And what the client actually wants to do is hear some acknowledgement that you've gotten the email, that you acknowledge that there's a problem, and that you're going to go work on it. Um, the flip side of that uh, that I've heard is, uh, so you send your provider a list of here's a bunch of problems with the website, and what they respond back with is a line by line, well, here's why we did it this way, and, and you know, uh, 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 here, you know, no client wants that either. Here's what they really want you to do. They want you to fix the problem. So what I always generally advise is the best idea is to respond pretty immediately that you received said communication. I got it. Heard what you said. You don't have to respond immediately. What I advise is taking what I like to call an air gap space between the time that you receive it until you are no longer emotionally vested in the response. That means not responding at eight, after like 8 p.m. that night. Like I never, like I, I'm a huge believer in what's called boomerang on Gmail, which means you can send emails later. And what I generally find is I write emails in the evening, and then when I look at them again the next morning, I'm like, wow, well, I could say that in seven minutes or you know seven words or less, but here I use 4,023, so let's cut that down. Um, you. You have to be able to emotionally distance yourself. Do not answer until you no longer feel any passion about the response, is generally my advice. Um, so there's a difference between these two things. Again, acknowledge your receipt, and then give yourself time to respond. Um, that's Boomerang, in case anybody. Boomerang is like a free add-on for Gmail. You can go to like Gmail Ads and add it on, and it will let you send emails later. Uh, okay, so... Um, I think nobody budgets enough time for QA, and it's probably one of the main reasons that clients get really pissed off. So we say, uh, we're going to give you a site on Tuesday, and the client thinks that they are going to launch it on a Wednesday. The reality is, if you're going to give a client a site on Tuesday, you should have gotten the site at least the previous Tuesday, so you had time to internally QA it. And that's the front end, that's the back end, that's every possible browser, that's every possible device. Um, I recently noticed that the mall is an excellent place to do your browser lab testing. You just go in between the mobile stores. Um, but you will catch a tremendous amount of the bugs before they ever go to the client. Um, and you'll find that it's not just one wave of bugs. You fix one wave and then there are more bugs that you discover or those fixes cause more bugs. It's kind of an ongoing process. So you need to leave time in your contracts to be able to get that QA done. It's like 
incredibly important. And then you need to create the expectation with your clients that they're going to have time to look at the bugs before it's ever going to launch. It is unrealistic to deliver the site on a Tuesday and launch on a Wednesday. Um, so <laughs> um, as a developer, I often find, or working with developers, I often find that designers, developers, even as a project manager, somebody comes back and tells you that there's a bug and you become very offended. You have a visceral reaction to somebody criticizing your work. So I think if you at the outset, in a very healthy way, just accept that all jobs do in fact have bugs, that it's just a part of the job, that there are bugs, there will always be bugs, there will probably always be another one. And don't get emotionally vested in people finding them, but merely get excited about the fixing of them, it will dramatically change how you respond to the clients. Um, so these are the, the after tips. Um, do a lot of you go to summer camp? Summer camp? Yes, no, maybe? All right, so here's the thing about summer camp. The last night of summer camp, they generally do this thing where they show photos or they show this video of you and your friends and um, all the really cool things that you did over the summer. And um, inevitably, you will all sob and you will call your parents and say, oh, my God, I can't imagine not coming back next year. As an adult, going back as a counselor to camp, I came to understand um, this is pretty much just big racket. Uh, we do this so that you will sign up for camp again the next year because summer camps get like 60 to 70% of their sign-ups for the next year in the week following camp. So this is pretty much just marketing, right? Um, but the end of the project is where you will ensure its success. So I'm sure all of us have worked on a job or a contract incredibly hard and it's fallen apart in the last 20%. Because that actually happens really, really often, right? You get pissed off at the end, and it's like, here you go, there's the door, ass door, contact, goodbye, it's been whatever, enjoy. Um, but when you fall apart in that last 20%, you're really killing the entire rest of the job that you did. And, I, you know, I run into so many young developers who are like, you know, I, I don't have any repeat clients, and, you know, they all end up being assholes, and, you know... It, if everyone tells you the sky is blue, there's some chance. Um, this is the same thing. You can be an amazing developer, but if you don't have the client skills to match it and you don't understand how this delivery aspect works, it's not going to end well for you, right? So uh, this is the first one. So remember the clients forget. You think your client is a 40-year-old CEO, but he's actually an 83-year-old woman with early onset Alzheimer's. He just doesn't know it yet. So, all clients eventually say, well, I don't remember you saying that, right? And you've told it to them like 23 times. So the issue is, as a PM, it's a really good idea to have documentation. And we all say that, and then we don't actually do it. But there are ways to actually do it. So there are project management systems. I'm particularly enamored of one called Teamwork. It's like Basecamp on crack um, or your drug of choice. Uh, I'm from Oregon, so that's pot, but that's another story. So... Um, uh, this is uh, what I do at the end of every single meeting. Every single meeting we have on the phone, I summarize the notes in a very, not a lot of adjectives, bullet pointed way, right? This is what we discussed. Here's what I need everyone to do, who and what, and here are the next steps, blah, blah, blah. So that anytime a client says, well, I thought we discussed making these orange, you can go in, type orange, and say, yeah, that didn't actually happen. Um, Document all the things, not just for cover your ass, but because clients do forget and you need a way to go back. Um, so number two is this, stop teaching WordPress. Um, you know, I've been doing this for like eight or nine years. There was a time where we actually taught people WordPress every time we deployed a website, and it was like, here's how you use WordPress, because we were using native posts and pages, and that's just not true anymore, right? Like we're all doing wacky things to the admin, and... What it's really about now is actually teaching people how to use their website, right? So what I mean by that is here's how to make, you know, one of your blog posts. Here's how to manage the hero image. We're distorting everything with ACF and with pods and with all kinds of other stuff, right? So I really love this plugin called WP Help. It sticks a help menu in the top left of your WordPress site, and you can add all kinds of articles about uh, – now everybody's writing down, welcome back um, – so uh, all kinds of articles about how to use the website. I put screencasts in there. Uh, works really, really well. Um, courage autonomy. So 
part of the reason WordPress has been successful uh, is because everyone was really tired of webmasters, right? When was the last time you heard anybody called that? So we've been telling people for years, well, if you use WordPress, it's like, you know, you can handle it on your own. That's not actually true. We all know that. But the idea is we want to make it easier for clients to have choice. We want to offer them choice, right? So everyone remember Rudy, right? What was interesting about this movie was here was this short running guy who was never going to get to play football, and yet he continued to come to practice every single time, you know, even though he had zero success, right? And we all go, that's really kind of interesting. Like, how long would you stay on a diet without losing a pound? So the same thing is true of clients. You have to prompt, you have to find ways to give them a tiny bit of success, or they're going to stop using their website, and that makes it unsustainable. Um, this is actually a brand new thing I started doing on this last deliverable. So uh, this is basically explaining, and I just put it into the WP Help menu, how their website works. And what I mean by that is sometimes uh, you'll be using Zapier or If This Then That or some plugin that controls some functionality, and that stops working, and they haven't talked to you in three years. So they don't understand why it's not working, right? So this actually just explains, here's how everything in your site functions. Like, your fonts come from Typekit. That is what makes them the font that they are. And we're using advanced custom fields. That's why when you go to this page, you don't see anything on the page. And, you know, we're using this plugin that controls this. So I've spelled out for them the entire website, the functionality. Am I concerned that I'm giving away the secret sauce? No, because... We want them to have choice. What this does is say, here's how to use your site. If you choose to come back to me, great, but you're not beholden. That doesn't set up a great client relationship. Um, this is another one. When we talk about the blog, this is co-schedule. So I, before I deploy a site for a client, make sure that they're signed up for this. It basically creates an editorial calendar for WordPress. So if somebody tells me they want a blog, I say, great, we're going to spend an hour brainstorming six months' worth of blog topics and put them into co-schedule. If you can accomplish that, we build the blog. Because I think clients don't understand how complicated that portion is. Um, doo -doo -doo. So uh, think positive. I want to be very specific about this. So because we work in WordPress, we don't actually sell technology. What we sell is services. So whether you like it or not, we are in the service industry. So if you do not like clients, client happiness is really our product. If you don't like clients, you need to get out of the business. Um, there we go. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, the last thing I talk about is, uh, in terms of sustainability, when you walk away from the product, setting them on a good course, which means telling them, here's what you're going to need to do daily, weekly, monthly, yearly for your website to sustain. So blog every three days, renew your domain, blah, blah, and show them how, where, where all that happens. Document all of that. Because without that, you're not, you're really kind of setting them up to fail. Um, so yeah, so I think that's it. Is that a thing? Yeah, I got about five minutes. All right. Q&A? You're a very enthusiastic fun. Please, <laughs> simmer down. Yes, sorry. Um, what do you do about keeping plugins in WordPress to sell updated? I've had clients like hit the update button with all the plugins active and it's like white. And then they call me. Okay, so um, <laughs> this is complicated, but not really that complicated. There are a set of things called WordPress breast. Bleh. They're not called breast practices. They're called best practices. Um, theoretically, if you code your site correctly and you're using plugins that are also coded correctly, that should not happen, right? You shouldn't get the white screen of death. But that does happen. And the next guy is going to talk about ways to recover from hacking, which is somewhat related to this, right? Um, I think part of this is I use admin roles really extensively. In other words, I very often create a super admin role, or I call it God. So, like, even the admins are limited from some things. But, like, to be fair, that then limits them from doing some things. That makes them dependent on you. I think it's about explaining to them the process, um, making sure that they have backup, right? Like, I'm not going to deploy a site without some form of backup. So whether that's Vault Press or I, I am enamored of Backup Buddy. I think Backup Buddy is just the bee's knees. Um, 
whatever that process is, if they have good backup, then they're not going to screw it up that badly. But you need to educate them. Again, you know, part of this daily, weekly, monthly, whenever you see the red dot update, understand these are the repercussions. You may want to do this. One of the benefits of WP Engine, to be frank, is that they have, you know, dev versus production staging. So you can do it in, you know, dev and then push it to production. Um, one of the other things is to use a site like uh, Maintain or, God, there are a whole bunch of them out there now that basically update things for you and buy you some insurance hours. So, options. You look like you have a question, but your hand isn't up, yeah. but I'm going to, yeah. You can. You can push from staging to production on WP Engine. Somehow, developers have a Well, let's not use that developer again. <laughs> Send them to me. I'll, I'll have a guy take them out. It's fine. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Oh, what, sorry. Oh, I'm terrifically you, you agile. Your, your, your you should see me with Wee Fruit Ninja. Yeah, I'm yeah, amazing. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, really interesting. Just, I'll add a comment. Um, when you're trying to get to priorities, mm -hmm. often clients don't know. And I've been on the customer side, too, like working with designers. I'm like, I don't know. Make my site better. You know, um, but, uh, and help define what those priorities are. I forget who said this, but a favorite quote of mine. Um, keep asking why until you get to the money. Like, so to to, to help define priorities, yeah. keep and asking why you know, until you get to the money. Oh, why do you want to do it? Well, and I think the basis of that is sound. It's yeah. not really about what they're asking, it's about why they're asking. Yeah. Right? Like, what, it, what is the client's money? I mean, I had a client today, I had a project manager say today, you know, this client really needs you to mirror everything that they say. And I thought, what an astute observation that, like, that's the key to them. It's not as simple as just responding to their email. You need to mirror what that, that's just, that's their pro, you know, everyone has a process, right? We find some people's processes really aggravating. I had a stoner ceramics professor who just babbled endlessly all the time. And then somebody just said, you know, that's just his process. And it was like a key. I was like, oh, yeah, I don't even have to listen to it. Like you can walk away midstream. He's totally cool with it. But like appreciate people's process and, and you know, yeah. <laughs> 